Hey, good morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Dan. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here um, at this uh, remarkable conference. I've I really uh, been very impressed by what uh, Jan, Ruben, and the rest of the team have put together. Um, it, it's, been, uh, it's been a pleasure to be part of this already. Um, so many thanks uh, to the uh, Listen Foundation as well. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys uh, this morning about something completely different. Uh, as Jan mentioned, I, I wear many hats. Um, I'm a pediatric neurologist. Uh, I specialize in CP and movement disorders at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Uh, but I also run a research laboratory. Uh, so part of me uh, is wondering why exactly Jan wanted me to speak this morning um, in a conference that was so practical and pragmatic. Uh, because many of the things that I'm going to be talking about um, are a bit pie in the sky. Um, and I, I, there's a possibility that I, I might uh, stray into medical speak, or my, my, science, my inner science geek might come out. And if that happens, please stop and redirect me. Um, but, but nevertheless, what I'm really hoping to do here is to, to share with you, uh, with you guys uh, some real research findings, some real data, uh, and show you that there's some very exciting things that are in the pipeline at this point in time. Some of this is, is our work, some of this is, is that of others, uh, some collaborators, um, and uh, really, more than anything, I wanted to just give you a flavor uh, for what's happening. So these are my disclosures. Um, again, I, I really just wanted to talk to you about uh, genetic evidence. Um, that there's actually increasing data that suggests that genetics might in and of themselves explain some forms of cerebral palsy um, outside of uh, blood flow related injury to the develop, developing brain outside of prematurity. Uh, and then also I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of how some of these inherited forms of CP uh, might nonetheless have a common basis uh, if you look at the, the level of brain biology itself. Uh, and so some of this work, as I mentioned, comes from, from my laboratory, uh, which is based in Phoenix. Um, our focus is on, on uh, really movement disorder genetics, trying to understand uh, the mechanisms at the level of the cell and even at a, a deeper resolution of what's going wrong to lead to problems with movement. So um, I'm not going to belabor this. Uh, any of the other speakers have already uh, mentioned this definition, and all of you in this room know very well what CP is. Um, however, I'm going to uh, take you just a little bit through the, the history of CP. Uh, and CP as a, as a concept really started in the 1860s. Uh, Little was an orthopedic surgeon in the United Kingdom. Uh, who delivered uh, an address to the Obstetrical Society of London. And in this address, he talked about uh, labors that pregnant women would go through where a child had been, quote, partially suffocated. And he felt that this injured the nervous system and it resulted in the spasticity and other findings that are seen in cerebral palsy. Uh, Osler uh, then went on to write a book, The Cerebral Palsies of Children. And this was really the origin of the term cerebral palsy. Uh, but this kind of continued in that same vein, that it was a type of birth injury, uh, what they call birth asphyxia, uh, or lack of blood flow, lack of oxygen that contributed to the condition. Uh, and then interestingly, Freud, several years later, uh, never wanted to stray from uh, controversy. He actually wrote a study uh, where he disputed birth asphyxia as the cause of CP. He questioned whether this explained all causes of CP. And if you fast forward from the 1890s to today, uh, the state of the science is such that about 1 in 250, 1 in 300 children are affected by some form of cerebral palsy. Uh, and at this point in time, we have fantastic evidence uh, and some very, very strong basic translational science that tell us that extreme prematurity and lack of blood flow are truly well-established causes of CP. Uh, I'm not disputing this by any stretch. Uh, however, I would ask a question, does this explain all of the cases of CP? And I would argue that, in fact, it's not. And so this is a paper uh, that was written by uh, Karen Nelson, one of the, the gurus of the CP epidemiology. And um, her work uh, really is focused on trying to understand some of the factors uh, that can lead to CP. And from this recent paper was the statement, current data do not support the belief widely held in both the medical and legal communities, and I would say also in the, the lay community, that birth asphyxia can be recognized reliably and specifically, or that much of CP is due to birth asphyxia. Interesting. So we're going to talk, um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm really going to focus on uh, spastic forms of CP, uh, but much of what I'm going to say could certainly apply to, to other forms of, of CP as well. 
And uh, really, the, the fundamental question that I'd like to, to present to you is, is, it, is, that, uh, is it possible that there are, quote, primary forms of cerebral palsy? Uh, this is uh, cerebral palsy that every clinician would agree is, in fact, CP and not one of the other conditions uh, that Dr. Jan mentioned earlier. Uh, but this is, this is not attributed uh, to brain malformations, for example, genetic syndromes, uh, the distress syndrome, metabolic disorders, or blood clotting diseases. Um, in fact, these are, are single gene defects that might um, explain uh, cerebral palsy in a proportion of children and adults. Uh, and so some of the, the recent literature has actually started to increasingly suggest this, this might be the case. Uh, these two papers are both epidemiologic studies. Uh, the top study, actually looked through many, many uh, earlier studies on the incidence and prevalence of cerebral palsy. And as Dr. Jan mentioned, it found that CP was, was relatively uh, constant across several decades. Uh, however, one study that they excluded from the analysis found that the prevalence rates um, in certain communities were in fact much higher. Uh, and one of the factors that they recognized was that, was that there was a, a high rate of interrelation by blood um, so-called consanguinity, and they felt that this um, highlighted the potential for genetic contributions to CP. Okay, well that's, that's epidemiologic evidence. That's, that's interesting and perhaps thought-provoking. Uh, but if you go forward um, a little bit further and look at large-scale studies, uh, this top one is a study that was done um, in Australia, in an Australian population. Uh, the second uh, was done um, by another one of our collaborators, Kazuhiro Hakimoya, in Japan. Uh, and these studies looked at MRI findings. Um, so as Dr. Jan mentioned, MRI is, is the, one of the first and uh, preferred tests for looking at the potential cause of CP in an individual uh, child or adult. Um, what they found was very interesting, particularly in those with spastic diaplegia. Almost half of them actually had normal or near normal MRIs. Uh, and those that, that did have some abnormality on the MRI uh, often had so-called non-specific findings. So the doctors couldn't reliably point to these MRIs and explain why that given child had CP. This actually led the authors to conclude um, that these findings suggest that there are, quote, unknown pathophysiological processes. That is, that we're missing something. There's something more to the story here uh, that has to explain CP in a proportion of kids. Because for some kids, the story is very clear. They're born very prematurely. There are factors and an evolution that very clearly um, supports the idea that their prematurity led to their motor dysfunction. For other kids, there's a clear history of birth asphyxia or an in utero in, uh, insult or injury of some kind. Uh, but for some kids, they might be born to term. They might have normal or non-specific MRIs. Um, they might have a, a number of other factors uh, that I'll discuss later that suggest that, in fact, there might be something else going and so this idea that there might be a single gene form um, of cerebral palsy has really started to gain momentum. Uh, and the very first paper uh, came out on this about 10 years ago. This was a study from Israel that studied an extent, uh, extended family in which it was shown that loss of a single gene, which they called ANGRE15, but I'm going to have you try to remember as KANK1, uh, loss of this single gene seems to lead to spasticity in affected family members across multiple generations. And this was described as a familial form of cerebral palsy. <laughs> Subsequently, there have been multiple studies um, that have identified additional patients and additional families uh, that have started to slowly accumulate. And what's been found is that there might be small differences from one group to the next. There are now additional genes that are starting to be identified that in and of themselves lead to cerebral palsy. So the question comes up, all right, well, CP is a very common disorder. As we mentioned, it affects roughly 1 in 250 children. So when do you go, how do you go from these very, very rare conditions uh, that affect single families or a handful of individuals somewhere in the world, uh, and how does that relate to the larger uh, population of people with CP? collectively is very substantial. Uh, and this was a paper that was published uh, in the journal Lancet Neurology. Uh, and the authors actually asked the question, is it possible that CP might be similar to other neurodevelopmental disorders, like intellectual disability or like autism? Um, in autism, for example, we know that there are literally dozens, if not hundreds, of genes that can be mutated. And when that 
mutation is present, that can lead to autism in that child. There's a, a mistake um, or a misprint in the, the DNA in the book of life, so to speak. And that actually affects brain development and affects, leads to a cascade of events um, downstream of that. The idea is that perhaps each of these individual genes might be rare, but that collectively they might be a window into the common biology of what's going on. And they might help us uh, to look at the story in a completely new way. And so that, I think the question that that begs is do hundreds of CP genes exist? And I think it's certainly possible. So our work with CP actually began uh, back when I was in Oregon. And I started to see this young lady. Uh, this was taken at Shriners Hospital. She has spastic diplegia. And uh, I, I was a trainee at the time. And, and being a good trainee, I went diligently through all the different, uh, different questions that, that one has to ask. And I asked, OK, tell me about the family history. You know, are there any other neurological disorders in the family? And the father said, well, well no, not, not really. And he said, well, except for my other three kids with CP. <laughs> and I said, wait a second, what? Because at that point, I had been taught that CP is never genetic. And so I think it was this single family um, who brought me into their world and really taught me um, a great deal about uh, CP biology um, that led me down, down the path that I currently on. So this was, this was actually a single family. Um, they had four children that were uh, born to parents from Jordan. Uh, that young lady that I showed you, she was functioning fairly well in uh, third grade. Uh, she had spastic diaplegia. Her three siblings, um, two girls and one boy, um, actually had spastic quadriplegia. They were much more severely affected. Uh, but these children were all born at term. Um, and interestingly, if you look at their MRIs, there's really nothing that would explain the CP. Their MRI was relatively normal appearing. Um, and if you look closely, I don't even know if you can appreciate this up there, but there are these tiny little white matter abnormalities that clinically we had no idea what to do with. We didn't know what this meant. Um, and if we looked a little bit further using some more sophisticated imaging and mapping out those white matter tracks, the, the connections between brain cells, uh, we actually found that there were some, some differences we could detect. But nothing that told us why these patients had CP. So this is a busy slide, but I'm going to skip to the punchline. We, we basically used some fancy, fancy genetic techniques, um, including next generation DNA sequencing. We were able to map the gene um, out of the whole genome, which contains more than 20,000 genes. We were able to map, map, map it to a very small region that contained about 100, and then perform additional analyses to identify mutations in a single gene, uh, this gene called ADD. I was very unimpressed when we came across this gene. This, this gene actually affects actin and capping. And actin is a, a protein that exists in all of our bodies. It actually helps to form the scaffolds and the foundation for our cells. And I thought, how could this possibly have anything to do with this condition? Well, when we looked a little bit more into the story, it was actually quite interesting. So our gene uh, contained the blueprints for how to build a protein. Okay, so it's it, this blueprint had a mutation in it. And so this protein, which is called the ducin, um, located here, was actually not formed correctly. Um, and ducin is supposed to function as a stop, as an off switch, okay, for the growth of these actin filaments that again form the scaffolds for cells. And this was very interesting. And knowing a little bit about the biology, we were able to look at this. And what we actually did was we took cells from the patients, and we took cells um, from control individuals that were the same age, the same sex. And we just looked at their biology. Okay? And, and the bottom line is that when you treat the cells with a compound called LPA, um, the normal cells will form actin filaments to a certain point and then level off. But the patient's cells will show this uncontrolled growth of actin filaments. All right? they, they take off. And so really what this told us was that this genetic mutation was actually affecting the basic biology. And if you think about what these filaments are actually doing, as I mentioned, they form the foundation for a brain cell's shape, all right? And as part of doing that, they actually help to control the neurite outgrowth. They help to determine how brain cells will reach out and connect up with other brain cells. And if that process is impaired, if you have a bad foundation, your house is in trouble. If you have a bad foundation here, the bridges that you try to create uh, between different regions can actually collapse. And that's what we believe is actually happening. That's what we believe we were seeing on the neuroimaging of the patients when we first looked. 
So that was all well and good. That was in the, the test tube. And we said, okay, well, that, that's interesting. We, we seem like we, we have some, uh, some interesting evidence here. But we, we've gone now from the patients to the test tube. We wanted to take it to an animal model. We wanted to take it to a model quickly. So we thought about using mice, that it would take time to generate the mice and characterize the mice, at least a year. Uh, so instead, we, we decided to uh, connect with a colleague who studies fruit flies. And before you said fruit flies, who cares? Uh, it turns out that there's actually a lot of fantastic neuroscience research that's being done these days on fruit flies. A lot of what we're learning about, um, about how the brain connects up and develops, um, is being done in fruit flies because these things grow so quickly, because we can manipulate them easily, um, and because they're cheap. And so, combine all those factors, we said, look back, we look at fruit flies. So when we looked at the fruit fly brains, we saw these tiny little spots, these tiny little lesions. That was interesting. That was reminiscent of what we saw in the patients. Uh, but the most remarkable thing was that when we actually looked at the walking of the fruit flies, we saw something. Um, and I'll never forget, my collaborator, Doris, called me up one day and she said, Michael, you're not going to believe this. The flies can't walk. So the flies that are lacking the gene that was mutated in our patients when you tap them down to the bottom of the tube, and then you make that tube so narrow that it can't just fly up, but they have to walk up the side. You can see that their, their performance is paltry compared to the normal flies. The normal flies do far, far better than the human flies. So this was animal model evidence that our gene mutation probably was leading to this disease. And so we ended up, uh, we ended up publishing this. I presented this to uh, colleagues in, in basic science and, and in hospitals. And uh, most of them said, oh, that's really cool. So what? He figured out what causes CP in four patients in the world. And I said, OK, you're right. You're right. But having a background in rare diseases, I realized that this could serve as a window. And this could help us to look into basic biology. Because what we noticed right away was that our ADD3 gene affected actin capping. But lo and behold, that other gene that had been identified very first, the KANK1 gene, functioned as an actin capping protein as well. And so we came up with the idea that perhaps what's happening um, is that you have these forms of, of actin that are just kind of free floating. Uh, and they're supposed to actually function uh, to be built into these functional change, to be built into support cables, um, and to be built into roads and bridges for your cells. Uh, but what happens if you lose kink one or if you lose a ducin is you actually lose control of these things and instead of having a nice um, well uh, maintained bridge you have this uncontrolled growth of actin uh, that can lead to these out of control actin filaments and accumulation of these abnormal filaments and so we decided to look a little bit further at this um, and, and this is data that, that so far has been published but what we, what we found was we, we reached out to the original group uh, in Israel. And we said, do you still have cells from your patients? In fact, they did. So we looked at those cells in the laboratory. And what you see here, this, this is real science, guys. Um, this, is, uh, this is showing you that if you look at control patients okay, that are matched for age and sex, that the same age, same sex, versus the patients with the kink one mutation, um, if you look at the filamentous actin, which is in this column, you see that it's, it's really not too much, not too much to write home about. But if you look under the exact same conditions um, in the patient cells, they produce an inordinate amount of this abnormal um, accumulation of actin filaments. It just um, accumulates rapidly. So we thought this was very interesting, especially as if you go back to the basic biology um, of a neuron. Because it turns out that brain cells, we use these actin filaments, um, again, to form that scaffold form the bridge, and it's particularly important that the axon initial segments. This is an electron micrograph showing you with unprecedented detail, helping you look inside a single brain cell to see that there's a whole highway. Um, this, this makes LA look like, uh, look like nothing. Uh, but, but if you could think about this, this is actually a very, very um, well orchestrated, carefully controlled um, environment that controls the way that these brain cells will actually grow, develop, branch out, and connect with other brain cells. And this is for a single cell. So if you think, again, of what's going on inside a human brain, uh, there are literally thousands upon thousands of these connections in billions of cells. There's a lot that could go wrong. 
Um, so the model that we have at this point is that there's probably these excessive acting filaments. They lead to these abnormal neurites, these outgrowths from the cell. It probably affects the way that the neurons will actually connect up with one another and talk to one another. That can disturb the entire circuit, and that can lead to spastic cerebral palsy. That's the hypothesis. So is there any evidence for this? Well, if you go back to the literature and look at what's already been done, um, this is a, a Chinese paper that was published, uh, but they looked at patients that have spastic diplegic cerebral palsy, for we don't know like what reason. Um, and they actually found um, that there are very specific patterns. The gray matter is affected, but there's also specific patterns um, of white matter involvement that are seen in these patients. Uh, and this is not a new idea, that, that white matter involvement um, and that the uh, connections between brain cells are disturbed in, in patients with CP. So again, this is, this is some, some geeky science stuff. But what we're looking at here, this is what's called a growth cone, or a plesia, which is a, a sea snail. Um, and again, you might say, so what? But uh, Nobel Prize winner Eric Kandel used the sea snail model very effectively to look at learning and memory. And what you'll see in, a, in this, this aplesia model is that all of these um, red filaments, these are actin filaments that are reaching out when the, uh, at the time that the nerve cell is actually forming. It's sampling what's in the environment, um, and then it's got a backup in green. Uh, those are the tubular filaments, and those will actually reinforce the connections that are supposed to be there. So this is part of how um, a given nerve cell will actually reach out and, and form functional connections. Here's another movie of the same process, and you can see that a lot of these processes are withdrawn, um, but some of them are in fact maintained, and the ones that are maintained are the ones that actually help nerve cells to connect up with one another. So to go on and take this idea a little bit further, the, the question comes up again, so what? How, how relevant are genetic forms of CP? Um, because if the answer is that they're actually relevant, uh, there might be quite a few CP genes still out there waiting to be discovered. Uh, and again, going back to this paper, when you look at the literature, uh, current estimates suggest that as many as a third of CP cases may be genetic. And that kind of blew me away when I first thought about it. That number might be a little high. Some people say that number might be a little bit low. Um, but I'll tell you, if you think of a third of 1 in 250, that's a lot of kids that have or might have uh, genetic causes for their CP. So we actually decided to, uh, to look into this a couple of years ago. Uh, and with the support um, of our colleagues uh, at the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, uh, we actually formed a, a collaborative network, the Cerebral Palsy Genetic Research Network. And uh, what we did was we said, all right, in order to answer this question, this is too big for any one group or any one institution to try to tackle, uh, especially since at the time I was working at a small institution in the Midwest. And so what we did was we partnered up with institutions across the US and around the world, including Australia and Japan, uh, and we started collecting samples from patients. Uh, and what the, the idea is, is that this, this actually would be a multi-institution collaborative network. And that we would collect um, patient samples. And we would collect samples from patients um, who had CP for unexplained causes. Um, the doctors, the parents, um, they felt that there was not a clear explanation for their child's CP. This has proven to be probably the most difficult part of this entire study. Because the idea that CP is always caused by hypoxia, lack of blood flow, or prematurity is, is so prevalent. Um, and I think there are, our work has really opened up a lot of questions. Uh, for example, if a child is born at term after normal pregnancy and uh, has the cord wrapped around his neck once, uh, but otherwise is born without complications, uh, has uh, apgars of eight and nine, feeds well, goes home after one day, um, and then develops signs of CP at age one and a half, there are cases uh, where the CP will be attributed to the cord being wrapped around the neck. It's debatable, but I would argue that that might not be appropriate in that case. We might want to think again about the potential cause of that child's CP. So again, our, our goal is to, to collect patients that don't have an explanation for their CP, um, and to not only collect samples from that child or that adult, but to collect samples from their parents. Um, because in order to really harness the power of genetics, we have to look at the mother, the father, and the patient in order to see, well, what's different about this patient that's not seen in the mother or the father at a genetic level that could explain uh, their CP. 
So we're doing that through a process called whole exome sequencing uh, with the idea that we'll uh, gather our resources and we'll pool our efforts uh, in this uh, major undertaking, which is looking to discover new causes of uh, CPD. Um, and so one of the things that we've recently done is we've partnered uh, with colleagues at the Robinson Research Institute in Adelaide, Australia. Um, and the Australian group, group uh, led by Alistair McLennan, has already um, gotten a great head start on this work. Uh, they recently published a paper just earlier this year um, where they identified a handful of additional potential CP genes. Uh, this was done at a genetic level. And so all of these are, are potential candidate genes, uh, but they're to be definitively classified as causing CP, further studies were needed. Uh, what was interesting is that when we first talked to our colleagues about this, uh, you know, we said, well, what, what's the common connection? And they said, well, there is isn't one. And uh, you know, that was a little disheartening. But we looked a little bit further at the genes, and we said, you know, I, I wonder um, if, in fact, there, there might be a common connection, if, if there might be uh, a connection, again, at the level of the cytoskeleton, that these genes might all affect the way the brain cells form scaffolds and connect up with one another. So in terms of the work that's going on in my laboratory uh, right now, we're asking the question, well, how does, how does losing one of these genes that, that should have the instructions for how the cell should function normally and how it should lay down these delicate networks um, of actin and tubulin, what happens if, if this gene is lost? And so we're looking at this um, in the lab, and we're, we're doing a, a number of different processes. But essentially, we can take a look at a single neuron at a time we can create a computer reconstruction of these, um, and then we can actually uh, recreate uh, schematics of the neurons. It might be a little bit difficult to see, but what we're starting to see already at this point is that if you look at controls, they're significantly more complex appearing. They have more branches, um, as opposed to neurons that are actually lacking some of these CP genes. So for example, for KANK1 and ADD3, we see that they're significantly less complex uh, and their, their basic structure uh, is affected by the, the loss of these genes. So then, um, going on, yeah, we, we looked at the, the idea that there could be a, a pathway that, that could connect up these rare causes of CP. Uh, and, and by doing that, this is, this is just a, um, a single assay, but what this is, is asking is it's asking, do these abnormal actin filaments accumulate in multiple different forms, not only the kink ones, not only the ADD3s, what about these other genetic mutations? Could there be a common link? So again, you have control patients here. They don't have accumulation of the filamentous actin. The kink one, as we saw before, these patient cells, they have accumulation of abnormal amounts of filamentous actin. And very interestingly, three of the other genes that we looked at right off the bat had a very similar pattern of um, abnormal actin filament accumulation suggesting that there's a common biological process at work here. Uh, we were a little put off by the fact that one of the genes didn't, in fact, uh, show the same pattern because we had predicted that it might. Uh, but in fact, when we look closer at this, it turns out that, that might be because that, um, that gene uh, was not present in the only cells we had to work with, which were blood cells. So this didn't necessarily dissuade us from the underlying idea that there are these excessive abnormal actin species that are accumulating. And what we think that might lead to, um, again, is a, is a final common pathway uh, where if the foundation is disturbed, you can't build a stable home upon it. So obviously there's a lot of work still to be done. We found these candidate genes, we're still sequencing, and we're still enrolling patients in our genetic studies. We're looking for more participants um, at this point in time. Uh, but we have multiple different arms of the study uh, that we're engaged in simultaneously. So while we're looking for more patients and we're collecting DNA samples, out of the patients that we've already sequenced, we're finding some very interesting um, results. We're following up those interesting results by looking at cells from those patients that can be taken from blood uh, in the laboratory. And then we're also looking at them in, in brain cells that I showed you. Uh, but as I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, I, Dr. Jan had a call to action. We need better treatments. We need something in the future um, that's going to look at CP in a, in a new way. And, and uh, what we think we have here is very, very preliminary. Um, but nevertheless, we think it's interesting and, and potentially a cause for renewed hope. 
So we're asking the question, can neurons and neuron connections actually be restored? Is there anything we can do about this because the brain cells are wired up incorrectly? And we've known for a long time that uh, the brain attempts to repair itself. This is work that was done out of Boston Children's by Hannah Kinney, a uh, renowned neuropathologist there, and Joe Olby, a very famous pediatric neurologist. Um, and it shows that when the brain is injured, it tries to repair itself. Um, we ask the question, well, can we even do anything about this um, in the dish? So, again, we've moved past the point where we're at the level of the patient. We've now dialed it down to the very simple level. We have cells from a patient with that first mutation that we identified, uh, the ADD3 mutation. And again, those patients can't control the way that their cells form acting. And we, we saw that there was a very similar response. Once those patient cells are stimulated, they take off and they form uncontrolled acting filaments. It turns out that there's a compound that's derived from a sea sponge uh, that was picked up on a, a marine dive uh, as chemists were looking for novel compounds. Um, and we took that, that compound and asked the question, can this help to restore these patient cells function to normal? So we basically put some sea sponge juice on the patient cells and we found that at least biochemically in the dish, um, the patient's cell, stump, uh, cell function was restored to normal. So this was very interesting. But again, this happened at the level of the test tube in the dish. Um, we wanted to know, is there anything that can be done? We're still working uh, to develop mouse models. And because of the number of genes that are involved, um, this is quite a task. Uh, but we're in touch with a, a large group of international collaborators. And we have um, plans underway to actually undertake uh, studies at a large scale. But we do have this fly model that I had mentioned to you earlier. Uh, and so again, with the flies showing a problem with their walking, and the sea sponge juice showing some effect on the cells uh, in the lab, we asked the question, is there anything we can do at the level of the fly, a very simple animal model? Um, and this is preliminary data, again, um, unpublished. Uh, but interestingly, this is showing that there are defects. So these are untreated fly brains. And what you actually see here is that the architecture, the connections um, between the nerve cells are disturbed. They're abnormal uh, in the, the untreated fly brains. But when you feed them this compound, uh, the normal architecture is actually restored. And when you quantify that, that difference was statistically significant. What's more, uh, everybody wanted to know, well, what does that actually mean about walking? Uh, and what we found was that just by giving this compound to the flies, uh, we could substantially rescue their walking. Still not at the level of a normal fly, uh, but it's substantially better than where they started with. So this compound, it seems, may have some um, promise as a potential therapeutic in the future. And so I would like to close just by talking a little bit about some of the future directions that we're going to take. Uh, one of the questions that's come up is, well, how far can you take the fly model? Um, and so this is uh, actually a movie from a collaborator. This is, this is a fly, uh, but what you can see is that with the right microscopy, with time-lapse photography, uh, with some fancy software, you can actually characterize the movements of the fly uh, remarkably accurately. And this happens to be a normal fly, but using this method, we're able to characterize the fly's walking at an unprecedented level, and then see what the ability of the fly is past that gap. Um, so if we take flies that have been given CP by knocking out the genes that we find in our human patients, um, we're very interested to see what their walking will look like by this method. If there's a difference, we'd love to follow this up and treat them with that compound that we've identified and related compounds to see if that can actually help to improve walking in this animal model. Another uh, line of investigation that my lab is, is uh, very much engaged in at this point in time is taking advantage um, of a, a recently developed trick in, in neuroscience. Uh, and this basically starts with, uh, with skin cells. Uh, so you can take a skin biopsy, which sounds invasive, but um, it's actually about the size of a pencil eraser in terms of the piece of skin. You can grow cells from a patient with a given condition in the lab. Um, these cells are called fibroblasts. And then using a cocktail of different um, chemicals, you can actually reprogram these cells into uh, stem cells in a dish. 
So these are not human embryonic stem cells. These have nothing to do with, with fetuses. Um, these are skin cells that have been reprogrammed. So you can turn them into stem cells, and in fact, we've done this. Uh, and then you can treat them with a further cocktail, and you have uh, neurons. So you can very quickly go from skin cells to stem cells to brain cells and have a model of a genetic form of cerebral palsy in a dish that you can then characterize at the cellular level and you can manipulate um, using any compounds or any potential therapies that you think have promise. And so we think that in combination, these different techniques uh, have a lot of possibilities. They open up a lot of doors. So with that, I'd like to close, um, but I just wanted to summarize I hope that uh, I, I planted the seed for you today. Uh, I've given you a bit of a, a whirlwind tour of, of all the, the genetic uh, research that, that's going on and has gone on in the last few years. Um, but I wanted to make the point uh, that genetic contributions to CP, as opposed uh, to being esoteric, they may in fact be surprisingly common. Um, the second point I'd like to make is that these genetic forms of CP, even though each form will probably classify um, qualify as a rare disease. Uh, nevertheless, I think that these diseases, these forms of CP, may open up some very interesting windows to look into the neurobiology of CP that we can uh, evaluate using diverse models. Uh, and finally, uh, we think that studying these single forms of CP may actually lead to therapeutic advances in the future, um, although we're far away from, from prime time at this point in time. <coughs> So with that, um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, our uh, outstanding collaborators, Doris uh, Kreshmar is at Oregon Health and Science University, and she's really spirited with the fly work. Um, Alistair and Joseph uh, are at Adelaide and have uh, helped us really take the next step in terms of our patient sequencing studies. Uh, our funding is really uh, thanks largely to Phoenix Children's Hospital, although we've had uh, several other funders step forward. Um, the CP Collaborative uh, Network Dr. Jan has been very supportive of our, our early efforts, uh, as have some uh, other very big gains in, in CP field. Uh, and we probably most of all, uh, we've benefited from alliances with parents, uh, with families, with support networks, um, from folks like uh, Cure CP and CP Daily Living uh, that have really reached out to us to help, help us get the word out and help us recruit, because we're having to do this at a national and international level in order to be able to have enough patients and enough representation to do the studies we want to do on the scale uh, that we need to do. So, uh, if you're interested, how can you help? Uh, please spread the word. Come talk to me after the, uh, the break. Um, think of joining our study. Uh, our website is uh, very simple. It's crewerlab.org. Um, here's my, my email. I'd, I'd be happy to uh, share my contact information with you. Um, but uh, we're also on Facebook. <coughs> so inclined. We need to uh, continue to get the word out. We need to increase enrollment, uh, and we need to, to try to flesh out and to better understand what's going on here. We, we think that this is a very exciting time uh, for CP genetics research, uh, but we're only scratching the, the surface of the expert.